First, a uh, big thank you to the Dean for inviting me and um, just to echo what she said about uh, Jim Listen, um, who not only um, is here, which is wonderful, but Jim was a mentor of mine when I was at Oster's in Toronto. So uh, it's a particular honor to um, uh, be here and be with him and have been collaborating and catching up over the last few days. And I think all of you will soon find out, I think some of you are in the business faculty, some are in the law faculty, but that your Dow relationships and connections will both serve you very, you know, really wonderfully in life on a, both a professional and personal level sort of going forward and, uh, and really uh, encourage all of you to sort of stay, connect, stay connected to the school and to each other because uh, uh, it certainly uh, enhanced my personal sort of um, in satisfaction and enjoyment of what I've done. So um, I'm going to try to, in a probably in about half an hour, um, highlight some of the key things about this very large topic. Um, the topic um, that I'm going to try to focus on is doing an M&A deal. So I spoke to the business class yesterday, um, to one of the business classes, and a few of you are here today, and we covered, there'll be some, some similarity and overlap between yesterday's uh, discussion and today. I'm going to try to emphasize today even more about the cross-border elements, and also the particular role that a junior lawyer can play on a transaction, um, uh, big or small. And when we say M&A, people sometimes always assume it's, it has to be a multi-billion dollar transaction or a hundred million dollar transaction. The truth is all deals um, that, uh, whether they're big or small, are relevant. A lot of the very same skills are going to be important. Uh, the complexity of a deal isn't necessarily driven by its size. So um, sometimes the bigger, the easier it is, and the more straightforward. Sometimes the smaller can have all sorts of complicated wrinkles that you need to be aware of. So um, I'll jump right into it and I also give you a little bit of my background. Um, um, the dean has told you these nice accolades, but um, more importantly, I think it's... Um, What's interesting for me coming back is really where Dow was a launching pad for my career and really very appreciative of everything I learned here. And I just one thing, I, I don't know if people go online and Google what the dean has written, but um, <coughs> having visited the uh, legal aid uh, clinic this morning and saw Donna there, that was one of the sort of most important parts of my uh, uh, times at, at the law school. I realized that what Dow prepared me for, I really had, didn't have much of an idea when I came into Dow what I wanted to do. I would left, I had a whole series of interesting, a lot of things had an international element to them, um, but what each of them had was sort of a new challenge and a new uh, sort of um, a new opportunity. And what the Dean wrote, which I thought was really fabulous, and I think that um, I kind of fall back on every day because I kind of went out there and looked for new and interesting challenges and what I've done, she wrote, one of the things that makes law such a rewarding career choice is the wide scope of the knowledge, skills, and attributes that lawyers are called on to master during their professional careers and helps us learn how to learn. And I would say, um, really, you know, we all look for that practical piece of law school some days, and I certainly love my um, time at the clinic. But I, what I really left Dow with was a sense of confidence that Whatever the complexity of the issue and the problem was, I could solve it in one way or the other, and I felt that I had the tools and the skills, and I really look back, and that's why I'm so appreciative for my time here. So um, I ended up um, in Nova Scotia really by happenstance. I took a year off after high school. Um, rather, you know, at the time, a gap year, there was no such, no one called them gap years. I was kind of... Uh, confused and uh, you know to people and w wondering what I was doing with my life but instead I really turned out to be one of the most meaningful years of my life I ended up going on a program called Canada World Youth which um, brought me to Nova Scotia I'd never been to Nova Scotia never been to rural Canada right and spent four months here fell in love with the Maritimes and knew that I was gonna find my way back here somehow and I, I did that through Dell uh, a few years later in between um, I found a few exciting and fun things to do, like working at the embassy in Washington, D.C. I was leading tours in 
Europe on bikes. And then I chose um, a Toronto law firm called Oster Hoskin, which many people know and where Jim also worked for a big, big good part of his career. But I also, I wasn't as clear as maybe some people are even in this room about wanting to be a corporate lawyer. At that time, I was really on the fence. And I went to Osler's because they had what they called an alternative, summer alternative program where I could work for half the summer um, doing corporate work and the other half doing uh, public interest work. Um, and during my public interest work, it happened to be right in the middle of um, the apartheid crisis in South Africa. Mandela had just been released in February of 1990. I went there in June, and I worked for an organization called the Legal Resources Center, not too different from a, you know, Dow Legal Aid, frankly. And uh, it was, you know, really again a, an extraordinary experience for me. But at the same time, my time in Toronto at Osler's, um, I got really excited about the corporate work. I, I, I found it cooperative, collaborative, engaging, exciting, strategic. And that's, those are some of the kind of issues that I'll sort of dive into now. And I think that you'll uh, hopefully, you know, pe people are, and I've spoken to a number of students over the last 24 hours, uh, already see that many of you are finding some of these issues, you know, in, in the law school curriculum now and, uh, and are, are being challenged by them already. So um, this is just a, uh, a quote in the, in the Canada World Youth website. Uh, well, it just basically talks about um, my experience on Canada World Youth and uh, how I loved uh, my experience at Dal and Dal Law gets a mention in here as well. So, um, okay. So, what am I going to try to cover today? I'm going to try to cover for everybody um, what is a typical cross border deal? Who is the typical deal team and how you yourselves could see yourselves being involved and working on a deal? Uh, what is the role of a junior lawyer? You know, and I'll also show you what senior lawyers would do as well, because often, you know, really in the in the in the most exciting environments, you'll be there side by side with the senior lawyers, getting very engaged. And what can you do to kind of prepare and uh, and work towards those um, objectives? So, um, what kind of deals mentioned earlier? There's no single type of deal. They can they they really vary. There's large you know, mega deals, which we read on the front page of the paper. But the truth is, you know, I get to work on a few of those every now and again. But most of the time you're working on, you know, big, decent sized deals. But it's not, the, it's not necessarily these $50 billion deals. They're still big, significant, but complex, interesting um, transactions. Um, deals can take many forms, but some key things to keep in mind. Um, you know, and there's a lot of debate about actually number one. Um, who should you hire on a transaction on a cross-border deal? Is it somebody who knows a particular industry inside out? You know, do you have, do I, I think, I think my experience at this stage in life is that industry expertise is helpful, but not essential. It's really being a strategic thinker, somebody who can learn quickly about somebody else's issues. It's just like being, again, not to, just because the legal aid, um, uh, experience is so fresh. People come in and come into that office with a million different issues. Most of them you haven't um, had much experience with, but it's really your ability to um, listen, process them, and think critically and, and, and um, come up and problem solve right there on the spot. Then you do your homework and your research and pull together what the what the relevant expertise that you need to apply all of those other skills to the particular matter. Um, number two is obviously in the commercial setting. Um, what, what is motivating people? And that's sort of as simple as kind of follow the money. Why are people, what are people trying to achieve? What are the objectives? Understand who is in the transact, what, who the parties are, not just understand your own client, but understand the other, other side as well. Their objectives may be similar or different, and you, you can quickly find out. And I've been in rooms where people have been so stuck on certain positions, but quickly realizing that they could kind of get to yes quite quickly if they understood what the other side wanted. And it didn't necessarily, the two were not necessarily incompatible with one another, what they wanted and what the other side wanted. The third is processes everything, I would say, 
it's important, and maybe everything is an overstatement, but um, it's under being methodical, thoughtful, and being able to be flexible and adaptable and, and having a nimble mind and um, being responsive to all kind of um, uh, circumstances really critical. And that's going to be, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, and this came up yesterday in the class, but working internationally where there are multiple cultures um, and different priorities for different parties becomes even more critical. Um, you know, you can kind of walk in a room with your colleagues here and kind of think that you're thinking the same way and assume that, you know, your perspectives are reasonably similar. That's not something that you can do in the world that I live in. All the, all, everything that I'm working on is cross-border, which means that there's multiple countries involved. You know, in, in my instance, I'm based in Singapore, but that means there could be people doing... Um, one party can be in Indonesia, the other party could be in Thailand or the United States or China, and understanding again how people look at issues, how people deal with each other, how people try to, when they have a different opinion, how they raise that different opinion. Um, for instance, um, it's in, in some cultures, loss of face and not being... Um, critical or confrontational to somebody is a, uh, a very, very, it could be an enormous mistake and it could result in a, in a, in a breakdown of, of the dialogue very quickly. So again, something to be very careful about and um, it's something you learn very quickly, usually by making the mistake once. Um, so um, m and deals, um, there's no real off-the-shelf precedent. Um, there, it's not sort of you do it one way and you just keep doing it that way. You, you know, there may be some standard templates that you'll acquire, but most often the reason why you know, we are going to continue to have value, add value, notwithstanding artificial intelligence and otherwise, is because these deals require human thinking on each of these, understanding what really your various parties want to achieve. Yeah, there's going to be, um, I, I, that's not to suggest that um, AI is not going to sort of filter into all of our businesses and everything that we do in one way or another, but for the deals that um, I think we're going to continue to be able to add value on, it's going to be really relying on us individually to continue to um, be strategic, to be smarter than the uh, um, um, than the AI. Um, okay, I'm, I think I'm just going to... Um, we talked yesterday, very important, tax planning often is the driving force of an M&A deal. Um, well, uh, and I know Kim is here um, who can talk about that, um, is sort of what's, what, what's, who's leading who. I mean, there's a, I've been on so many deals where um, corporate people kind of think they have an idea and they rush out and sort of are thinking they're, you know, they're baking this cake and an understanding of what a deal is going to look like only to find out um, all too quickly that um, it doesn't work from a tax perspective. Value is being lost everywhere and leaked here and there and that. Um, so you will quickly find out, that's again one of the fun parts about being a corporate lawyer, that it's a very collaborative um, profession. Um, you need to bring in other experts. You need to be, and depending on the size of the deal, it could be environmental experts, clearly tax, you know, employment, um, all series of others. And all of a sudden you start to see that your team is growing and, and that's really where all sorts of other different skills come into play as well as, your, as well as just your pure legal ones. But I can't emphasize enough how important tax is and um, that just having, it's, you don't need to be an expert, um, you know, unless you're the tax person, but it does, it is, it is a really valuable um, piece of the puzzle to have an appreciation for um, and be able to at least talk the talk with your tax experts. Um, okay, um, I'm going to go right down to... Um, Nine, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. 
So page 14. So I'm going to jump right in because there's not that much time to some unique elements of cross-border transactions. Um, some people may have heard of FCPA issues, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or CFIUS, which is the Committee of Foreign Investment of the United States. Um, Canada has its own um, issues about foreign investment into Canada. But when you're doing international M&A deals, you need to think about a number of issues that you might not need to do domestically. And even, even domestically, there sometimes can be interprovincial issues. But on the international stage, you really do have to be very sensitive to other type of issues. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or the UK Anti-Bribery Act, for people who don't know, is really an issue to be sensitive to what, what's going on in these companies that you're looking at. If you're a U, U, US or Canadian buyer uh, looking abroad to buy a, um, a foreign company in Indonesia, China, or elsewhere, the, the, the level or lack of transparency is often a concern. And, you, and while there may be something business-wise very attractive about another company, until you have a very clear and, um, clear and certain understanding of what other issues may exist that could be enormously detrimental from a reputational perspective. Um, you, these are kind of gating items for doing these type of large deals that you know, we've, we often get a call before we even, before we go to step two of a deal, they call us and says, can you help us do an FCPA uh, anti-bribery analysis on a particular company? And we'll, um, we'll, help the, we'll help them do that they'll go through their kind of internal compliance. It doesn't mean that everything is necessarily risk-free because there's always an analysis of the pros and cons uh, of still proceeding, but people are gonna wanna understand, A, what the severity of something may be if there is an issue, and how they might be able to mitigate it if they do proceed with a transaction. So just something to always keep in mind. Um, and that also, with the CFIUS issue, um, these type of issues, um, and they go, you know, Canada has blocked some transactions because of they haven't wanted foreign investors. Um, I see it more from, from the U.S. perspective, um, and certainly with the current sort of world order or disorder, as you may call it, um, CFIUS has become an increasingly um, important issue. You know, we'll get calls from Chinese clients or others, you know, if they want to buy something in the U.S., before they go and spend thousands or millions of dollars proceeding with the transaction. They want to get as good a feel whether or not they think they will get approval for the transaction or if they will be blocked from doing the deal. So they should have never done it in the first place. So these are all kind of evolving and kind of issues that will change with the times and the, and the, and the politics. But in this current environment, they have, their, their importance has really been heightened and, and uh, we're spending a lot more time on them than we, than we had been even recently. Um, dispute resolution. Um, another really interesting piece of doing cross-border deals. Um, you have a com company from India, you have a company from China. They're both pretty nationalistic. They both want governing law. They don't, a governing law that they are comfortable with probably the people from India are going to want Indian law. The people from uh, uh, China are going to want Chinese law to govern in the contract. But um, how do you resolve this? Often what's, being hap what's happened, places like Singapore where I live have come in to try to fill the breach and say, hey, we can be the neutral party here. Choose our law. Choose Singapore law. Or if you don't choose Singapore law, it ch at least choose Singapore dispute resolution um, as the center for um, where, where these um, um, disputes will be resolved, for instance, and usually through arbitration. Um, I'm not sure if people know this, but most foreign um, judgments, like in, tri in, in, a, in a court, cannot be, are not recognized in other courts, but because of what they call the New York Convention, and people may be taking uh, international law or conflicts of law, but the New York Convention allows arbitration decisions that are made by recognized um, 
arbitration tribunals to then be taken and recognized in different jurisdictions. So um, again, it seems like something that if people want to get a deal, do a deal, is it wouldn't be something that would hold up a deal. You would be surprised. It's kind of right at that back and like what they call the boilerplate part of a, of a large uh, um, uh, but either SPA, which is a share purchase agreement or asset purchase agreement, but in fact determining A, what the governing law is, that people then feel comfortable that the choice of that law is the law that people uh, think interpret laws and is from a sophisticated enough place that they have enough a, 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 height and a, a, a degree of sufficient certainty that if there is an issue, they can rely on the jurisprudence from that location to give them some um, level of comfort that the outcome of a dispute will be a reasonable one, plus where that dispute will be heard. So I don't know if anybody has any questions on that or anything else so far, uh, but please jump in at any time. I know we have a question period at the end, but um, you, should, um, you should definitely jump in. Um, next one I'm going to try to do is just show you how a deal is often um, staffed. Um, and where you would kind of fit into it um, as a junior lawyer and then you know as a, as a, as a lawyer who would just sort of grow, acquire increasing responsibility. So you have the lead partner at the top sort of overseeing it. I would say you know in football terms the quarterback sort of the person who is seeing everything on the field who is responsible for client kind of a relationship as well, understanding the client's objectives. I would say a, a good partner that will try to share that vision, what the client's expectations are with everybody on the deal team because otherwise you, you can kind of find yourself spinning wheels if you don't really know yourself what the objectives are of the, of the, uh, of the transaction. You then have sort of the next level down what they call counsel or senior, senior associates. They're often doing they call the heavy lifting of the drafting of the document and putting into words what the understanding of the agreement is um, in, and into the document. And then you have what you guys will be very soon, which are the junior associates. And the junior associates are doing an extraordinarily important role on these transactions. And I'll go into it in the next couple pages a little bit more, but that's the due diligence. And the due diligence of a transaction, I cannot... Um, you know, overstate the importance of. Um, that's really, right again, um, front-loading a lot of deals and doing a lot of this stuff at the beginning is so essential to what I, you know, I think good client management, trying to figure out all of these different issues at the very beginning um, before you go to, whether it's again, as I say, tax or the FCPA or otherwise, but the due diligence is you Often, if you're the acquirer, you're trying to buy something, going in and looking at another company and trying to effectively um, look into its books, its records, and really understand what its, the strengths of that company are and what the weaknesses are. And that can be an enormous, have an enormous impact on value. You know, what you do or don't find um, can really have enormous consequences for your client. And I think, um, I, I think that I, what I've seen is a lot of junior lawyers are sort of sent off, kind of go see if you see anything without a lot of guidance or direction um, and not really understanding the mission of what, they're, of, what the, of, of what they're trying to do. And what I've tried to do, and, I, and, and I've seen it sort of, and I, and I think because of the heightened importance of it, watching associates who go out there, who understand, you know, who have given, have been given a real briefing on what the transaction is about, what you're looking for, where you kind of see the potential weaknesses in a, um, in a, in a company. Um, what, I'll give you an example. One of, the, one of the things that happens in Asia a lot, um, because a lot of these are family-run businesses, are that um, a lot of businesses have contracts with other family businesses. Um, and so where the value, well, they may tell you that, you know, we have this great contract, so our company is worth X, but the counter, but then you buy the company, and the counterparty to those contracts 
is a related company, and that related company may no longer <laughs> choose to do work <laughs> with you once you've bought that company. And so really understanding this web or tanglement of, of, um, uh, of corporate interaction is really essential. Um, you know, we talked about this yesterday. Other, other. Is that um, it's a great question. Um, it that's really it sh usually what happens is, um, and it's this. The, where where do you find it? Yeah. So. No. So usually, well, usually there's a, the the seller in this case. They would have a data room. So you would physically go to their premises, and in the I would say now in this modern now today. In theory, there should be what they call a virtual data room, where they will upload that and have it available to you. Um, but will they show it all to you? That's another question. So, absolutely. So, what do you do then? Um, but do you have to do you have to anticipate that you may not see everything and realize that there could be pieces missing? Yes. So then you have to ask for it. So that's where the knowledge of the company and understand, some understanding of it beforehand is really important. And then number two is what they call reps and warranties in the contract itself. So you may say, I think I've done all the diligence that I can. They've told me they've shown me everything. But what happens if they have it? That's where you have what, you, what we discussed yesterday in the business class was reps and warranties, where you go back to them and say, there is no litigation. And they will come back to you and say, there is, they will give you a list. There, there, there is no litigation other than the following. But if there, and, and then you make your decision to buy based upon that information and the value of the ultimate dollar terms that you pay will be based upon all of that knowledge. However, you still would, if it turns out that there is litigation or one of these sort of third party contracts that I mentioned um, that exists that wasn't disclosed, you would then have, if you've done, if you've drafted your contract to protect you in this way, you should then have recourse back to the seller. You have other issues then, like how, how do you get back, how do you get money once, our, once, once you've already given away? Correct. So sometimes you have hold back payments. So sometimes if you're really worried about it, you would sometimes have money that's held back for a certain period of time so that allows you to get into the business, to run the business for six months, one year, 18 months, whatever the period is. And then we also talked yesterday what is becoming increasingly um, a uh, part of doing mergers and acquisition deals is called um, um, reps and warranties insurance, where there's actually third party insurers who come in and do, yeah, so <laughs> there's a whole other industry. That the, and there's a few reasons for that. One is because of this issue of who do you go back, you know, the anxiety of the buyer of how, how you go back, but also that today's M&A um, kind of universe or ecosystem is increasingly filled with, almost dominated with what we call private equity parties, <coughs> which um, for some people, these are, these in the Canadian terms are like the Onyxes, but in the international terms are KKRs and TPG and Bain and Carlyle, people that have truly billions and billions of dollars under management. And, but they have a very different investing lifespan than other, like a strategic. So their, their purpose is to make an investment, to realize on it, and to exit the investment, and then to return the money back to the people that gave it to them. But to do that in a very quick manner, they don't want to be on the hook. for If they're the seller, for instance, they don't want to have what they call the tail of these reps and warranties that people could come back to them after they've sold. So they've also helped introduce this idea of this reps and warranties insurance so that there's, they would rather pay somebody to take on that risk and have the liability for any future issues um, against these third party insurers rather than them because they've now given back their money to, um, to their funds or to their, uh, to their investors. I think there was a. Just a quick question. I wonder if you would address valuation Say on the PE side, on PE I come to you. I probably already have my own my own valuation of the company in house, which I then share. Right, right. And you help the client execute. Is that kind of how that works? Or yeah. And how how do you assist the client in doing due diligence on a valuation that's usually handled 
sophisticated, like sophisticated client that's all in-house, is it? Or? Yeah, good, great question. Um, so the fun, again, the fun part of this is that the ecosystem of being a lawyer or a corporate lawyer um, and where maybe why clients kind of get agitated is we're not the only advisors. There's financial advisors and, our, and then there's tax advisors. And so there's all of these people working. And so usually, so if KKR hires me or, or my law firm, they'll ask for us to do a legal due diligence report. They'll ask KPMG to do a tax due diligence report. They'll ask somebody to do a financial, and they'll put, and then, but, but to make it work, we all have to be talking to each other and understand the value that you're talking about as well. Because the client expects high quality advisors to A, understand that, but also because we're, we're kind of interacting with each other all the time. I don't know if Jim had any, yeah. yeah no, I agree. Is pricing uh, in the value because the, if there are certain points that are key to the client, as Dave mentioned earlier, you want to make sure you're attuned to those and looking at those issues. It, it's David's point, right? That there's sort of two levels of discussion. The first is the discussion with the client: what's important in the transaction to the client. And the second is David's communication as lead partner to the council senior partners and junior associates as to what's important to the client, so that when they go to do their work or when they second tier a negotiating agreement, they know what's important to the client. So communication is key at this point. No. And the truth is clients often, you know, if you're a experienced you, what you can you're often guiding the client. You know, it's, your clients are going to appreciate where you're saying, hey, We've done this. They're going to they're going to they're going to have a choice of who they're going to hire, and you're going to be telling them, you know, we've done this before. We've done <coughs> ten Indonesia deals before. These are the key things to look out for. We have experience doing that. We're going to work with local. You know, again, another layer to this, which is important in cross border deals, is now, and I should have mentioned is local council, um, having people who know the local landscape really, really well, who can speak the language, who know regulatory officials, who can kind of ask those informal questions to the tax authorities. Hey, have, the, have these guys paid their taxes in the last five years? They'll tell you they have, but have they? And what often happens again, it's funny how you can, some, a local businessman or business can be in, in compliance tax wise, but as soon as you sell the business, all of a sudden a big tax liability surfaces for the foreign buyer. So, um, you know, call it coincidence or call it uh, what you may, but these are the kind of things you need to be aware of and having a feel for, you know, maybe a recognition that there will be a payment of taxes that has to be paid, but understanding what the magnitude of that will be. Because again, all of these things can really, you know, Diminish value and you and, and and impact after you buy um, and so and and another thing for which I'll get into in a minute but Doing M&A deals and it's, it's maybe true everywhere, but in particular in cross-border deals. It's Your counterparty or if you're gonna you know some some international buyers are brave enough to go and own something a hundred percent hundred percent, but more often than not they're gonna want to do it with a local party and, that, and having a local party that is A, hopefully rep, reputable, but knowledgeable and strong enough to help you navigate um, through challenges should they arise on the ground um, is really, really important. And I, I've seen both scenarios and I can tell you that um, I've never, I probably would say over the course of 20 years in Asia, it's in the instances where people have overlooked the importance of a good local party where they've been the greatest loss, where they just had, they've just kind of had to put their, sometimes walk away or put their hands up because they were kind of really boxed out of situations that uh, they would have otherwise been able to navigate if they had a, a, a strong local party. So, okay. Um, so th this is kind of what we've already described. These are just, you know, and, I, and people are welcome to have these slides after if they're helpful, but 
um, you know, just what the due diligence is really trying to do. And I think I've touched on a lot of these, but, you know, just to reveal the ne information necessary to meaningfully appraise the conditions of the overall enterprise value of a business. Um, you know, conducting a thorough tailored due diligence investigation is absolutely critical. And what you then end up with is, it's not as if people think that there's never going to be any blemishes on a deal. It's then coming, then it goes back to you as the legal team to say, okay, this is what we've learned. You're going to be handed that book of all those advisors as the lawyer, all the, the, the legal, the financial, the tax, and now you've got to put it into a legal document that you're going to propose as a means to protect your client and say, okay, well, I've learned this. We want to know that, um, you know, we think that this value should be reduced because of this, but... In, but if in the future this, uh, this event occurs, that we have some recourse against the seller. And that's where you, you know, how you write the document, how you, how you present it, and how you sort of, and then negotiate it is going to be absolutely essential as a, um, uh, as a, as a lawyer. Um, yeah. Absolutely. If something doesn't look right, don't be reluctant to ask the other side. Don't be reluctant to ask the more senior person on your team. If it just doesn't look right, I know it's a dumb question. Chances are four times out of five it'll be a dumb question. But the fifth time it'll be a very critical question. So don't be reluctant to sort of raise your hand about this kind of thing and ask questions. Uh, and uh, sometimes things are inadvertently omitted. Sometimes they're advertently omitted. Um, so don't be reluctant to just sort of say, what does this mean or why are we not discussing that? Anyway, no, I, I think that's a great point. I, th I think that I have seen, and sometimes distance or a new, fresh, you know, you can, I can have clients that I've known for years, but having somebody new, fresh, young, smart, look at something totally differently can make entirely, I come out with an entirely different conclusion or analysis that is super important. So um, Jim's point is absolutely right and, and really critical. So again, um, I think to answer your question, this is how the data room is sort of presented um, and where, how we then um, present it. These are again, um, we've touched upon this, um, some of the key diligence issues that will come up. Um, and there's a number of them, that's why this takes a while, and again, factors into some of these issues down to the FCPA down there, which I've already spoken about. And um, then, just a moment ago, I, I mentioned what do you do with this? You usually put into a report where it's synthesized, it's in a, in a straightforward manner for the client, who again, is going to be at this point, the deal's going to be going really quickly and moving fast, want something that is user-friendly, not sort of thousands of pages of just reciting what, essentially repeating what every document says. I've seen lawyers go in there and just write down everything because they think that's what they need to do. Again, that's the difference between you and a computer. You guys are going to be there to help synthesize, be critical, and try to put down what's really important um, so that it's going to be then um, converted into a format that's going to be client-friendly. Um, and um, you notice over the past 20 years, you've seen due diligence evolving or changing at all? Like, has it gone beyond just the strict, okay, let's look at some contracts, let's look at some yeah. IP, or has it gone to a kind of a broader kind of theoretical model of what risk could be? Again, think mining finance here in Canada, right. a bunch of new equity partners in private finance, they might build a mine in Guatemala, or there might be big human rights violations. Right. So, is there any consideration of that these days, or is it still kind of that? No, absolutely. I, I, think it, I think it's very case by case, but I think you're doing your client a disservice if, in that, if, 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 they're, if they're doing a mind in an environment where um, human rights or 
land issues or whatever they happen to be are important and could really impact the outcome of the deal, you should be doing that. And, you, and, they're, and if they're hiring the right lawyers or team of advisors, they're going to be looking at that. Because kind of the point I made earlier, those points, those issues come up. They're going to, they, they don't come up at the beginning where you want them to come up or you at least have identified it to your client. Your client's going to say six months down the road, hey, I didn't, I didn't see anything in here about these Guatemala land issues or environmental issues. That's exactly, the, and that's where getting local counsel involved understanding the local sort of nuances or issues of the moment are going to be absolutely essential because the truth is time is money you know they're going to you know and there are you know there's not any single deal that has to happen and if it, if it's not going to happen your clients really want to know sooner than later you know and so, you know I, I say that one of the best deals some of the best deals I've done are the ones that I never did where I actually felt that I did the best service for my client was where we did a, six, you know, a thorough due diligence. I don't like to kill deals. My job is to like solve problems and find ways to get a deal done. On the other hand, if the issue isn't solvable or it doesn't make sense or the reputational consequences are too big, your client wants to know right away so they can make a decision because they're the wasting, you know, what they've done is they've, they've allocated six months of their life to this deal that's not going to happen at the expense of pursuing the next three deals that they could have been doing. So it's, a, it's, it's key. And that's why it goes back to Jen's point. Like, there's no dumb questions here that you should be you know, looking at or saying, hey, to your senior guy, hey, I, I think this is an important issue in Guatemala. Should, uh, should we be ch having local council track this down just to make sure? It's just a follow-up on like, what the role is of council. Like, if, if you've got a client who wants to get involved in the deal, or they're starting to get cold feet, but in your perception and in all of the advisor's perception that this is a great deal for the client. Are you trying to make sure, are you trying to get this deal through? Like, is your client the deal, if it's a good one, or is your client the client, if that makes sense? No, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, I have, um, there, there are deals where, you know, you, you, you kind of, you, we're all human, so you could get emotionally connected to a deal, particularly after you spend more time. And I, I would say that your objectivity starts to become a little bit more questionable. Um, I, I remember a deal, um, I don't know, four or five years ago. It, it looked like everybody. In particular, I would say it's less the lawyers. The lawyers have less upside. You know, and some people say the lawyers make money anyway because they charge by the hour. And, 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 but the people that where I saw this happen most, where I think it can get the most confused, is where there's people at a company that have, they, they, this has been their life for the last year. They're like the senior business development guy. And his job was to do this deal. And then he gets into the boardroom where he thinks it's going to be a check the box. As he's gone to three buyer meetings and they said, I want to own a water plant in Singapore. You know, and all of a sudden, they're on the verge. They, they beat out five other bidders. They were, uh, they have, they're about to sign, you know, exclusivity and the guys on the board go this isn't a priority anymore you know that's where um, I think you can get more um, people with a conflict of interest because they have their own financial they're, they're emotionally involved their personal life you know they've invested months and months lawyers kind of I would say still need to stay dispassionate and that's their job, is to stay dispassionate, to be objective, not to tell the client, you know, you can tell them, they, they will ask you inevitably, what do you think? Do you, how do you, what is your gut? You've done this before. And the truth is, as a lawyer, you've often done this way more times than the client. You know, at the end of the day, it's their money though. And you kind of always need to realize that if they want to make the investment or not, it, it's, it's their call. But you can say, hey, you know, I have done this before. I think you're making a good investment. But they may, for a bazillion different reasons, but where I've seen the issues arise is where there's business people who have something at stake by not, you know. And one of the big issues right now in the world is there is a ton of capital, liquidity. These, these, the, all of these um, uh, private equity firms have billions of dollars and they're having trouble spending. Prices are high. And 
on the one hand, they can say, I'm really smart. I'm not putting my money in a dumb investment. On the other hand, if they don't invest, they don't have a job. So it's a real sort of <laughs> catch-22. Like at the end of two years, if they go, well, I've been, I've been the smartest investor out there because I didn't go buy something overpriced, they go, okay, you're a really smart investor, but I've paid you X and you've shown me nothing. And um, so, and that's happening all the time. And, and, it, and it's, so there's a lot of, you know, on the one, and, and on the other hand, they have, they're ready. Like they have literally are sitting on piles of cash and everyone else is. So as soon as that deal, that big deal comes along, all of those people I mentioned below are chasing that same deal. And, and then they're outbidding each other and pushing the price up. And, uh, and then, you know, that's when financial, you know, crashes happen. But um, so, but that, but that's, um, so that that's so it's it's an excellent question, and you but but as a lawyer, I think you need you your your goal is to kind of stay as objective as you can. But there's you do ultimately sort of get personally invested in the deal a little bit yourself. Yeah. So um, we talked a little bit of this. I'll just um, these are just the kind of things that lawyers would get involved in, um, and then um, lots of different documents. Um, here I would just say, um, very, very short in conclusion, successful associate shows initiative, delivers a work product on time and without reminders, diligent, pays attention to detail, um, well thought out, accurate, thorough, um, but always asks lots of questions before. You know, like, I mean, no one expects anybody like, to, to, know, to know something they shouldn't know. That's, you know, so it, the worst thing I think lawyers can do is spin their wheels. Like, yes, they have to be some self-initiative to go try to find some understanding on their own, on the one hand, but, um, but, but also to be asking lots of questions along the way. Um, project confidence with interacting with clients and colleagues, be receptive to feedback and try to sort of take it on um, when you uh, sort of do your next task. People notice that. No one expects you to get it necessarily perfectly the first time, but once you've taken the time to sp invest in you and to give you feedback, they do like to see that you've actually listened and, 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 and been responsive. Um, then the next, you know, in conclusion, you know, I just say, you know, challenge yourself, put yourself in situations where you need to think on your feet and communicate effectively. Um, build these skills. Law school is the best place that you could imagine to do that. You're lots of smart, engaging, interesting people around. Uh, be a broad, curious lawyer. Know the importance of cross-disciplinary exposure and self-education. And then enjoy law school. It's a great privilege and have fun. So, yeah. I, I, just a quick follow-up on this because I think, like you said earlier, time is money. And one of the real advantages we have as law students before that we have like, a significant amount of time. What are some, do you have any recommendations for self-education that we can do within that time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think finding opportunities, you know, people, you know the, all, lots of things that are already built into your law school experience, whether it's a clinic, whether it's mooting, whether it's just debating with your friends, some of it's the business, so, you know, the business association class. You know, it, it's kind of if you if you already have a passion or an interest, it's kind of building some of those blocks. So there's so you're off to a bit of a running start. But but I also think it's kind of what quoting the dean earlier is just being nimble and flexible thinking. And and and, and I and, and I you know it's kind of the debate, you know, how do you face this new world that we're kind of, you know, uh, which none of us really know what it's going to look like, but I would say that it's being flexible and that I wouldn't get too stuck in the details today. I would get stuck in the, in, in the conceptual, the analytical, and problem solving, because I think that is where, you know, you, you know, you're sitting in a room and there's always, you know, a few people who are kind of, you know, helping to really solve a problem, and they and they stand out right away. And uh, and there's no necessarily magic to that, but it, it but it's practice, and it's being getting increasingly comfortable articulating your ideas and um, bouncing them off friends, and uh, you know, speaking up in class, and thought, you know, and all and all of those things. I, I think I think it's I think it's really just being engaged as much as you can. Yeah.